Okay. Well, first of all, I just want to say hello to everyone. Good evening. Happy Friday. And thank you uh, so much to Zenny for saying I confirmed that everyone can hear me, correct? Uh, yeah, yeah. Thank you for coming, Tony. Okay. I'm, I have a message saying, okay, I, I was just unmuted there. Okay. And do you know that I, by the way, I don't mind if you want to unmute everyone and uh, unless there's noise. Um, that you way know, you I, uh, from my experience, uh, a yeah. lot of people sometimes come uh, like using their phones. Got it. And uh, this will uh, do a lot of noise. So Got it. Okay. I mute and then. Okay. Unless they want to say something. Okay. Yeah. If someone, you know, if I assume that everyone's familiar with Zoom, so if you want to ask a question, you can, I guess, use the chat feature too. Uh, you know, I would like this to be certainly interactive so that if you have some questions, that you have your questions answered. Um, so, but, um, okay, but terrific. So I just want to start by thanking Zenny, first of all, for setting up this meeting. Um, I should say that I've been so grateful to Zenny uh, for a, a long time now. I've led my forum, the Resource Center for Certified Interpreters, for about three years. And so, Zenny, you've been uh, there with me from the beginning, and you certainly have been one of my most enthusiastic supporters. Um, it never fails that whenever I'm out and about um, serving in one of the courts as an interpreter and I happen to run into interpreter and I happen to find out that they're an Arabic speaking interpreter. Uh, when, once I introduce myself and I give them an idea of who I am, almost always I get a response of, oh my gosh, I've heard about you. And it's always something good that they've heard about me or they've heard about the forum. And it's been through <clears throat> primarily through Zenny and so many of the Arabic speaking interpreters. And so I'm just simply grateful to you for that enthusiastic support that I've received. It's really been unlike any other uh, support that I've received. Not that I'm not receiving good support from any, anybody else, but I just wanted to especially thank all of you for that. Thank you, Tony. I'm always looking forward and following your footsteps. <laughs> oh, that's, that's sweet of you to say. And they know honey. me as Zina, so Zaini yes. is my Facebook name. Yes, got it. <laughs> it how, how does everyone know you? Zina. Zena, got it. Okay. Well, and thank you for, for clarifying that. No problem. And obviously, I know you with Zenny because all the postings that I've seen have come across my way from Zenny. Yeah. But, uh, but I, I get it. Okay. okay, terrific. So, what I thought I would do for tonight then is I'll give you guys a brief uh, bio so that you all know a little bit more about me. And certainly, in sharing this, it's not only just to talk about myself and all the things that I've done, but through sharing about myself, what I, my goal is to encourage uh, each one of you also to achieve, you know, whatever goals that you have. I know that I've always been encouraged by hearing about other things that my colleagues have accomplished. And so I'd like to, you know, be able to participate that way as well. So I'm going to share a brief bio. <clears throat> and then once I get into my presentation, so I thought about focusing on three specific areas. First of all, I want to cover my experience with the defense language proficiency test, um, and that's through the uh, National Language Service Corps. And I want to talk about that because I think a lot of good came out of that experience. Then I'll transition to um, the, my team-based approach that I've cultivated to prepare for my various uh, exam certifications. And then we'll, we'll close it out with a focus on AB5. And granted, I'm not going to go into, you know, uh, any sort of detail at all about AB5, um, but we're simply going to at least start the conversation about what AB5 is and, and how it's making a, a, an impact on all of us. And more importantly, kind of what's the strategy moving forward? How are we supposed to deal with it? All right. So before I jump in, any, any, does anybody have any questions about anything that I've said so far? Or should I just jump into my bio? You can I'll jump do. in. Okay. And yeah, I just got a call asking me if I'm going to comply with AB5, one of the agencies. Okay. okay, so that'll be, I'm sure that it's a very timely topic. Obviously, I'm sure all of us are getting phone calls, letters, emails. And so at the end, I certainly hope that we'll have a very spirited conversation about that. All right, so to start with my bio. So I did not know really about interpreting as a career until I jumped into my preparation for this as a career 
in the summer of 2015. So that's when I started my program at the Southern California School of Interpretation. And I focused right away on the legal or the court interpreting program. I knew that they offered a medical interpreting program, but I never even considered it. And uh, really, I, I realized later that that may have been a mistake. But again, these are some of the things that you learn along the way. So anyways, in the summer of 2015, I started at, 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 the, at SESI. And so it's a one-year uh, program. We took four classes. At the end of it, we got our certificate. So I finished that in the summer of 2016. One of the things that I did right away, though, is I started uh, working as a volunteer interpreter anywhere and, and anywhere I could, because that's really the only experience that I had. And so I'm grateful for the school because they gave me an opportunity to work as an interpreter at a local high school. I also worked at Stanley Mosque in the Domestic Violence Center. And again, I got some much needed experience there. And then what I did was in the spring of 2016, I made my first attempt at the oral exam. So the timeline is I started it like in July um, of 26, 2015 at, the, at SESI. I took the written exam in December. I passed that, took the oral in, in March of 2016. And the reason I did that is because I just simply wanted to know what is this exam about? What are my strengths? What are my weaknesses? And how do I prepare for, for success? In November of 2016, I started working as an interpreter in immigration court. And once again, it was extremely valuable experience for me. In the spring of 2017, um, one thing that I did was I started taking classes with Edgar Hidalgo in trans interpreting. I discovered Virginia Valencia's note-taking uh, technique. I discovered her book. Um, I proceeded to order other materials from Virginia Valencia's company, Interpretrain, including a video. And I was so impressed by what I saw with Virginia's video that what it prompted me to do was to pick up the phone and call her. <laughs> um, I just called the company and I thought, well, you know, what's the worst that could happen, right? But the idea was that I wanted to call her and speak with her about setting up a live online training class for my team. I was leading a team of five to prepare for uh, success on the state exam. And I figured that everybody in our team needed to improve our note-taking skills for consecutive. So I asked if she would lead us in a, in a training class and she graciously agreed. And it was the first time that she had done that. And then after that, she continued offering those um, note-taking uh, classes to other, other groups of people. So through that, I really got to develop a relationship with Virginia Valencia and Brad and everyone there at the uh, interpret training team. And uh, so fortunately then, by, the, by September 2017, I did pass that exam and that was my fourth attempt. By then I had really honed my team-based approach. I had learned my note-taking skills from Virginia. Um, I had some great materials with Edgar and everything kind of came together for me. Um, I also made the decision that I was going to get certified as a medical interpreter. And I took and I passed the, uh, the written exam for medical interpreting in December of 2017. Then I passed the, or the CCHI certification in January. So the next, major kind of event was that in September 2018, so I got my badge. I passed the September exam, got the notice in December. I got my badge in March. So I began working, doing depots and whatnot. And then that led to an opportunity to apply for a position as an intermittent interpreter at San Bernardino. Intermittent is an independent contractor or freelance position, but I'm working for the courts. And so when the courts in San Bernardino didn't need me, then I went to work for the courts in Riverside, Santa Maria, Los Angeles, um, uh, gosh, all over the place, right? Um, and so that was a good experience, Orange County, that was a good experience for me because it gave me a chance to meet a lot of colleagues and get a lot of experience. In uh, the next event is that in May of 2019, I took my, made my first attempt at passing the oral exam, the written exam. I was supposed to get a score of 75 in both portions of the exam, and I scored an 88 in English and then a 72 in Spanish. So once again, I was working with a team of colleagues to pass the federal exam, and two of my team members passed. So of course, I was very happy for them. I quickly found two other team members to replace them, and then we're continuing to work 
uh, we plan to take the, uh, the federal written exam in the spring of next year. In December of 2019, I took the defense language proficiency test, and I'll be talking a little bit more in detail about that. And um, I, once again, I achieved the highest score possible with that exam, a three out of three. It was a very challenging exam, and I, I gl I'm glad I did it. And I'll discuss that in a little bit further detail. So my plans for 2020 is I plan to take the federal written exam. Um, I'm actually going to sign up for a Spanish class to help me just find, continue to fine tune my grammar. I plan to take that in January for the next six months. And then uh, my plans for 2021, I plan to take the federal oral exam. And then once again, the three points that I'm gonna cover tonight, my experience with the DLPT exam, team-based approach, and then we'll talk about AB5. So is there anything about um, my bio that anybody has any questions about? All right, so if not, I'm gonna transition then to talk about the defense language proficiency test. So what happened there is that once again, way back when, when I first started um, my, you know, I was really, when I, when I, mean, I, I suppose when I first started my forum, I started hearing something about this organization called the National Language Service Corps, and I went to an introductory meeting, but I was really confused in terms of what they offer or what, how it could benefit me. So I became a member, so to speak, but I didn't do anything with it. But I was on their email list and whatnot, so I got an email like in October of this year letting me know that they were going to be offering this test. And then, so I was intrigued by it, so I decided to go to the meeting. So that was the first step, if you will. So I attended an informational meeting that was led by Don Inslee, and then they explained what the test was. And the reason I was even drawn to it in the first place was because they said that the exam was free, was a language proficiency test and that uh, they would provide some free materials to, to prepare and I thought well those materials could help me for my federal exam anyway so I thought why not right so I said okay I'm gonna do it and then I was just very persistent in following up with everybody and I kept after them so when is the exam how do I sign up when's it gonna take place so I finally got connected with somebody named Kelsey Petit and she was very responsive she got me set up so they told me that I would have to prepare for a seven hour exam that was gonna take place at a military base called MEPS. It's the Military Processing Center. So I was thinking, wow, a seven hour test, like this is gonna be, you know, that's gonna be something else. I, I, I packed a picnic lunch and everything, right? I'm thinking that's just gonna be draining, right? So, um, and then with the materials that I got, I just started, preparing, I started looking over those materials, working with them, and I thought they were good, and I had a good idea that the exam was going to be a two-part exam. The first was going to be uh, listening skills, where I was going to listen to a dialogue in Spanish, and then I would answer questions about that dialogue in English, right? So that's what I did, and um, so everything kind of was very smooth about my exam experience. They, I arrived at the center on time, they need me to bring a passport with my social security number. Um, and um, so they set me up on the computer. And then I ended up finishing the exam in three and a half hours. Although they said that they'll give you up to seven and that sometimes it takes people up to seven hours. So, um, all right, so I took the exam and then I got my scores that day and I scored a three in both sections. The, the listening skills, I guess it would be, and then a reading comprehension portion. Now, I posted that experience on my forum, and it was really interesting, to, the, the feedback that I got about it, because I really didn't know that much about the exam. And so there was a gentleman by the name of Mervyn De La Torre who responded and said, hey, congrats on your score. And, he, and so I just wanted to share with you just a little bit about what he wrote, because it provides some information about the significance of the exam. He says, achieving a three on DLPT5 is no easy task. Linguists can obtain a rating from zero to three with a half point proficiency, such as zero plus, one plus, two plus. And then I asked about what's the other part of the exam. There's a second part of the exam. He says an oral proficiency interview. And he said, I was in the military and supervised military intelligence linguists. Thus, I'm a little bit familiar with this language training program for soldiers. And then the DLPT exam is a battery of foreign language tests that were produced by the Defense uh, Language Institute and used by the United States Department of Defense. 
so um, <clears throat> anyway, so that was, you know, my experience with that exam. And then also I asked, um, I wanted to know um, about the Arabic language testing. And um, so this was provided by Salma Yusuf Bales. She said that they do offer an Arabic version of the exam. And um, she said that uh, they, they seem to have, I think she mentioned something about Egyptian Arabic. And, um, and, and Selma anyways. Is here too. Yeah, what's that? Selma is here. Oh, perfect. Okay, so, may, so she would be the better person to, to speak about that. So I, I was asking some questions today about that because there's standard Arabic is what I learned today. And then Egyptian Arabic, I guess, is a dialect. So maybe Salma can speak with us a little bit more about that. Um, but I just wanted to confirm that my experience with taking that exam was a good one. Um, I have another objective measurement of my language skills. One of the, one of the things that I like, too, is I'm going to be interviewing very soon for a full-time position with the courts. And I simply like the idea of being able to set myself apart, right, from the next candidate, right? And so I can set myself apart by saying I've got my state certification, I've got my medical certification, I did this uh, DLPT exam, I scored the highest score on that. And I think that anything that you can do like that that will set you apart and confirm your language ability is always a good thing. And especially that this is a free exam and all you need to do is sign up for it. So I did reach out to my contacts to let me know if um, when the next information meeting is going to be. So as soon as I have that information, I will pass it along. And if you guys want to take it, I, I do recommend it. And, um, and maybe uh, if Salma can speak about the Arabic uh, exam, that would be great. Hey, guys. Uh, hey, guys. You okay, I just had my, my, uh, my speaker. Uh, my experience was a little bit different. I was um, contacted by uh, somebody that was rec a recruiter. Oh, God. That was for the federalization process. And we went through a lot of paperwork, and then oh, they wow. sent me to, um, to take the test. They connected me with the um, testing officer, and they told me, okay, can come, I can come in to the MEPS, and mm -hmm. I did. Mm -hmm. um, however, the testing officer was not there. That was in San Diego. Mm -hmm. So that she had an assistant there. So they sat me down, and what I requested was the Egyptian Arabic. Okay. Um, I'm Sudanese, but they didn't okay. have the Sudanese version. Okay. So, uh, so I took, um, I took the listening portion. I didn't mm -hmm. score as well as you did, mm -hmm. but when I finished the listening portion, they said um, there wasn't, there wasn't the second part wasn't there. Mm -hmm. They didn't have it, so there was oh. some kind of confusion. Oh boy. Then um, a little while later, um, the gentleman's name that was communicating with me, the recruiter, was Thomas French. Okay. And so he communicated with me, um, hey, what were your scores? I said it's inconclusive, but however, my listening scores were not up to par. Mm -hmm. So, um, and I wasn't contacted again. Oh. Then I was reached out again in the beginning of this year by mm -hmm. another recruiter asking mm -hmm. me if I would like to start the federalization process. Wow. And so I had to tell her that I've already been in contact with Thomas Friends from January of 2019. Okay. This is what's been happening. I reached out to him actually today in anticipation of this meeting. Nice. Okay. And thinking, okay, let me give it another shot to right. see if I can take the MSA this time. Right. And see if I can, if I can do any better, if I can right. fare any better. Mine was a two out of three. Okay. So that's not a passing score. Oh. But when I let the lady know, uh, the second recruiter that contacted me, and I told her that I've been going through the process, I still have to take the MSA. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, she said that um, yours is still being processed. There is mm -hmm. nothing to do on your end. So it was a little confusing because okay, yeah. how could it be when yeah. I'm not? Um, I, I have been a member of the Facebook page for a while now. Right. And there seems to be a little bit of complaints with regards to not getting assignments. Uh, yeah, I agree. But, it, yeah. but I do agree with you with regards to setting yourself apart by right. taking the tests and putting that. It's just additions to your resume. Exactly. So that's You're what I got. Right. That's what right. I got in terms of input. Right. Yeah. Right. And I find it interesting that they were reaching out to you because I would imagine that there is a very strong demand for Arabic interpreters. 
um, I, they didn't reach out to me just um, just out of nowhere. Uh -huh. yeah. um, this is when I had started. I've only been working as an interpreter for a couple of years. Right. Me so yeah. when I first started, um, I was just applying to different jobs. I was online. It. So yeah, it might probably. have been one of them. So I received an email saying Got thank it. you for you know volunteering. And I was thinking, no, I want to get paid. Right, right. And right. so he called me. Right, and then right. um, I said, well, what is your work again? And then he explained that it is, um, it is a volunteer position. However, the government doesn't like to right. have you work for them for free. So it is, right. he listed all that's, it's however much an hour and they give right. you stipends and they exactly. cover you for whatever. So, right. yeah. So I was like, oh, cool. Okay. Right. To work in the federal government. Yeah. And so that's the thing. I think it's, and I'm, I'm so glad that you shared your experience and your insight. And it's very closely parallels, you know, my experience and, and different in some way. But um, yeah, I, I feel that as long as you kind of have a, um, a good understanding of, you know, kind of quote unquote, what you'll get out of it, then, then you're good. And you're right. It may not necessarily, it may or may not lead to a lot of jobs per se. But at least now, you know, I figure, well, I've taken the exam and if, if they reach out to someone, they know at least what my level is, you know. Absolutely. I, it's I just didn't... so so you know yourself exactly. what you're capable of. And it's it's exactly. um, it's advancing your, your career. Correct. I think so, too. I, I think so, too. And those materials that they sent me, I, I, uh, I'm going to continue to use them and work with them. By the way, another thing, too, is that keep in mind that the the test is different than what we do because it's a test on listening skills so i'm just listening to two native speakers from spain so i'm hearing very you know accents that i'm not used to i'm hearing two speakers from argentina that they have the more they always pick the more pronounced accents right? yes it can be difficult to can i ask a question um yeah. was it also like in arabic anyway um it was more of a conversation to where it would be uh, a phone call like hello hi faiza what's happening you know i'm really i just moved okay. in this new building mm -hmm. and you know the uh the elevator noise is is driving me nuts and then you would hear this conversation and then after that it would ask you questions however yeah. some of the answers in english to me tripped yeah. me up yeah so that yeah. that's possibly why i got a, a lower score than a three okay, okay. so yeah I'll, I'll be happy to go into my specific you know experience with the exam so what I heard a conversation between two, they, it would say at the beginning, this is from a conversation that took place on the radio in Sevilla, Spain, right? Okay. So there'd be two guys and all of a sudden, like you're in the middle of a dialogue of some type and they're just laughing and yucking it up. And But the topics were either scientific, political, religious, economic. They were intense, you know, sociological, psychological like the vocabulary, I was in a daze the whole time. I'm thinking- Egyptian oh, Arabic was nowhere near that, Tony. Oh my god! It was not, no, and not that I remember, it was not, the Egyptian Arabic anyway. Whoa, I was in a daze for the whole exam. I was like, and so I looked at each answer choice and I'm thinking, and, and the answer choices were very convoluted. Yes. You know, every, the, you know, you get four, right? And it's just like, yeah. holy moly. Yeah. So I just thought, well, I've got nothing to lose, right? So I'm just, I'm just going to do the best that I can. So I was, did it a, outstanding. I was in a daze the whole time. I never felt that I got an easy question. I never felt that I got an easy dialogue. And One thing also that I, I noticed know. is that you cannot like uh, it gets repeated. So they say the, right. uh, the dialogue and then it gets repeated. It gets you repeated. have no option to say, yeah. I don't want it repeated. Right. That's true. Th that's not an option. That's true. So just heads up to whoever notes. wants. No, you can't take notes either, which I wanted to take notes in a bad way. Uh, well, or actually, I take it back. There, you can take notes, but on the computer screen, and I don't type that fast. So if you're a fast typist, maybe that would help you too. But I don't type that fast. I'm used to taking notes, like you know, writing it. So. Yeah. But anyways, but thankfully everything went well. So, but by no means, I would never tell anybody it's an easy test. At least not not in Spanish. No way. So, but. All right. Well, thank you so much for sharing so your experience. Does anybody else have a question? The material were helpful enough for the exam. Anything that it, you know what it was? It was helpful at least for me to know what the format of the exam was going to be. But I didn't. I, I felt that the the length, the the difficulty of the language, was far more advanced on the real than on the practice. Or maybe I just didn't get to the more advanced materials. I don't know. 
I, I always, I kept on thinking, gosh, I can't wait to go back now and see, because man, I thought, here was my thought. As I was taking this exam, I was thinking, shoot, if I read stuff like this or listen to dialogues like this every day, for the next six months, I'm going to be ready for that federal exam, <laughs> you know, because it was so elevated, you know, like I'm thinking, where do they find all this stuff? You know, for us, um, for us as Arabs, uh, it depends on the dialect that we are, that our ear is used to. Some yeah. of, some of you guys might be, um, your ear might be very in tune to different dialects, yeah. even yeah. in classical Arabic. But if you have somebody that is speaking classical Arabic and has a Kuwaiti accent, I, for me personally, yeah. I have or Iraqi accent. I have to concentrate really hard because the sounds are just slightly different. Do you yeah, agree, um, Arabic interpreters? <coughs> yeah, I, I agree. I agree. Like I'm familiar with Iraqi, but uh, probably Kuwaiti. Yeah, the Gulf area is different. A bit. What about Tosan? What do you think? You gotta unmute yourself. You gotta unmute her. Okay, I unmuted you. <laughs> okay. Yeah, but he's Sudanese uh, too. <laughs> I, yeah. Hey. Yeah. I had no idea. I didn't know there are other uh, I'm aware of only one Sudanese interpreter in the United States. And I, I am it. honored to meet you. Leah shut up. Leah shut up. Yeah. We have to talk. Absolutely. So, nice. Yeah. So, and um, I interpret mainly in court settings. And so, um, because the cases repeat themselves, um, I honestly, you know, I don't go into, you know, expanded in chatting or, you know, conversations with people with different uh, dialects. So, I'm okay. You know, I can, I can understand most of them except the Moroccan or Algerians. This is oh, the yeah. only ones That's that I have problems yeah. with. Yeah, because they but, have French inside. You know, like, we don't know yes. French, we will not understand yes. them. Yeah, but once in a while, I hear something, you know, that I'm not familiar with or I cannot uh, figure out from the context what it means, and this is when I run to my app and ask you guys <laughs> you know and um, yeah these guys are better than any app our, <laughs> yeah the whatsapp yeah yes. and you've been very helpful but um it's been uh, you know so far no problem that's good that's yeah. cool that's yeah. cool all right so I know. So that was all that I had covered um, or planned to cover with the uh, exam. And as I mentioned, any information that I get regarding the next informational meeting, I'll pass that along. Does anybody have any like, questions? Uh, mm -hmm. uh, you said something about the first portion, which was listening. What oh, yes. About the rest? Okay. Yes. Reading Thank you for that. Yeah, you're right. So there is, so when you go to take the exam, there'll be two portions of the exam. The first is listening skills. The second is reading comprehension. And once again, you're given a very uh, challenging passage to read, like in my case in Spanish, and then I have to answer questions on it in English. Um, and it's, it's tough. And I think that's why they give you more time, I think, to take the exam because they figure it might take you a long time to get through that material. So and you again, don't I, do interpreting, you don't do like uh, no. consecutive simultaneous, just no. listening comprehension and answering in the other language. Yes, um, exactly. May so I, great. Tony, um, yes. I will, um, I'll dig in my emails or I'll dig in my files and see if I have the, the practice material for Al Arabi. Oh. And I'll send it to you guys. I'll send it to you, Zainab, since you've got everybody else. Yeah, sure. Thank you. That would okay. be great. Yeah, sure. Yeah, that material is very good. Um, and then there is a part two to the exam, and it's called OPI, <clears throat> and it's the oral proficiency interview to establish the DOD student's proficiency in speaking the language. Um, so there, um, and I was told that, that the way it's structured is that you can only take one exam per year. Fortunately, I just took the exam in 2019, so presumably maybe January, February, March, I can try to take this oral proficiency interview. Because what this guy told me, Mervyn Dilatore, who's got experience with the exam, he said it's best 
if I can show what my scores are for all three portions of the exam. Um, so anyway, so they do have um, a second part of the exam that's oral proficiency. And so it's not going to be proficiency in interpreting, but just simply in speaking the language. So I just, I don't know really at all what that it consists of, but I assume that uh, if it's an interview of some type that somebody will sit down and actually speak with me. I, I, I don't know if anybody else has anything to add to that. I don't, I wasn't really informed about that when I went. So um, yeah, is if I know if I find out anything more about that, I can also share that with you at, at some point. You know, I've been member with them for like years with the yeah the national language, and um, we they do some training. I don't know if you're familiar with those. Usually in LA, mm -hmm. and usually they have sometimes you know just parties for New Year yes. and stuff like that, but they never sent us. Uh, to real assignments here. They, right. they only do it for, they say, disasters. But I did get offer for jobs from the FBI and mm -hmm. other, place, other other government entities through them. Yeah. So they are very good, I think, uh, organization to mm -hmm. join. I think so. And too. be a part of, yeah. I think so. I think How so. How do you it's... sign up for that exam? Um, you know, so what I did was I attended an information meeting and I get the impression that they prefer to do it that way. Um, if you can sign up directly, I'm going to ask my contact because I let my contact person know that I would be meeting with a group of Arabic interpreters. And um, and so what I'm hoping is that if, if she would just tell me, yeah, if they want to take the exam, just direct them to me and that way you guys don't have to go to the information meeting and it just kind of save you one step. Um, I've got another suggestion, Tony. Yeah. I can also put out the, the, um, the recruiter's name, Thomas okay. French. Okay. And Fantastic. I can send you his contact information okay, and you could good. just email him if you okay. like. Okay, good. And um, since my name is in the database, go ahead. Yeah, that's good. I have a question and maybe a suggestion also. I'm not sure uh, it's about the question, but uh, Sauson, I'm sorry, I don't know if I pronounce well your name, uh, is uh, was just asked. Uh, but they found me through LinkedIn. I don't know if you have LinkedIn profile. Uh, so I, th I think that this is what they use to look for people because uh, mm -hmm. like two people or three people from their department, they uh, emailed me through LinkedIn. Mm -hmm. So maybe this is also the way to make a good page on, on LinkedIn. Your with me, when I first started with them, like I, I emailed them, they contacted me, they did any like over the phone interview and exam, mm -hmm. but it was consecutive. Uh, oh. It was like interpreting, but oh, that's that was great. two years ago. Oh. oh. Okay. Yeah, and huh. after passing this exam, it was a very short exam, just to make sure that I'm a linguist and stuff like that. And uh, then after that, they did recruit me, and I became a member. Mm -hmm. There was a lot of changes over the years, so mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. I've been here like I think it's been like over five years, probably. Uh -huh. Yeah. May I? Uh, hi, this is Elian. I have my uh, video off. I'm sorry. Uh, may I add a little bit of my experience to this uh, discussion, if I may? Yes. I uh, taught uh, diplomat Arabic and French and prepared them for this test. And uh, some of uh, the people that I taught were able to get the level three. Okay. Uh, and they um, they had no experience of Ar with Arabic at all. So we learned Arabic together. I taught them Arabic from the beginning until they got their level to a standard, a high standard. And this took us like a year, two years to get a high standard of MSA and dialect Levantine dialect, which is the uh, Lebanese and uh, Jordanian Palestinian dialect. Uh, I would just add, um, Tony, for you, the OPI, Yes. Uh, from what I understood, if it is the same for you as for a diplomat, okay. I don't think it is the same test or they, or they ask you to have the same level as a diplomat who's going to sit with the other, mm -hmm. with other like 
with diplomat with a foreign language. But if it is the same test that you take as a diplomat from the uh -huh. United States going to okay. a, a foreign country, okay. you would have two raters in the room. Okay. And they will be discussing with you high level um, uh, current affairs, okay. uh, stuff about the environment, yeah. stuff about very, very high level yes. language Understood. that you need to prepare for. Got it. Mostly is, it's in Spanish. Okay. So they, they, they want your foreign language. Yes. More than uh, your English. That that was for my students, for the diploma wow. I used okay. to teach. Oh, that's so great. So they want to know if you know mm -hmm. stuff, stuff about uh, astronomy. Right. Stuff about uh, animals. Right. Stuff okay. about weird things that right. you really need. They want to know what's yeah. your uh, level. A language yes. level. Wow. Well, I, uh, I also sat for the FBI test and I passed it. Okay. And, and they did something similar, which they just want you to, to give them your public speaking skills. Okay. Wow. Okay. So the FBI test that I uh, sat for was for translation. So they okay. already... Uh, I had already passed the translation test and passed the language test, but they move on into the oral test to see your public speaking skills. Okay, interesting. So uh -huh. good luck, uh, Tony. It is. I, it's, thank you. And congratulations on this on the three that oh, usually you. comes for uh, diplomats. That comes with a promotion and a lot of money. Wow. So, so good luck. Hopefully you get the money as well coming right. from it. <laughs> yes, yeah. you know, yeah. from your lips to God's ears, you know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so far I haven't seen that money, but uh, but certainly a lot of, of uh, uh, great reward. And I should say that my greatest reward so far has, had, has been this opportunity to discuss it with all of you. I've learned so much, you know, from all of you regarding your experiences with, the, with this exam. It's really something. So thank you. But, but my question is, were you taking, I know that you wanted to take this test for your own, uh, to know your level and to add something to your resume, but were yes. you taking it thinking of working? Do you think, because what I understood is that the uh, LS interpreting division, is, is, we're talking about the Department of State and the LS interpreting division, correct? Or no? You know what? I don't know. If there, if there is an opportunity, certainly, Mm -hmm. then I'm, I'm interested. I, I haven't been told of anything, but I would certainly okay. ask. Mm -hmm. It is, is because they have, they have multiple level of, uh, if it is, this, Zainab, do you know if it is the uh, uh, Department of State? The, yeah, Are there is to... one for the yeah, Department of State. Uh, it is, uh, I did it once in 2000. It wasn't like, didn't have mm -hmm. that much experience at that time mm -hmm. but so i don't know if it's the same it's uh it for me it was over the phone mm -hmm. and they had a, like a small paragraph of i know that there is an interpreter here in our area that already passed that it was a small paragraph of political like from the newspaper political mm -hmm. article and the, like something from the news mm -hmm. okay yeah, I think it was like two small paragraphs. I'm not really sure it was like 19 years ago. And uh, then if you pass, that's it. But I don't know because if they now they have something more advanced because this is, I'm talking 19 years ago, so I don't know now. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But we, you can always like go to their website, contact them, and they will tell you what to do next. What about the FBI? Because they How have, they have four levels. They have four levels of uh, interpreters at the, at the, Department of States. They have mm. the international visit. Mm -hmm. visit. They call it the liaisons, and then okay. they have liaisons interpreters, seminar interpreters, and conference interpreters. Oh. So depending on your level, and uh -huh. I, uh, and then then they will take you depending on the testing. Mm -hmm. And um, but my, I did the FBI when I I have a BA in translation and I really wanted to work as a translator, not as an interpreter when I first started because mm -hmm. my because of my kids and uh, 
and I had a newborn at that time. And then so I applied for the FBI and I sat for the test thinking that, uh, you know, mm -hmm. let me just try it. Mm -hmm. And uh, we, I was the only one who passed with another Russian interpreter. It was a grueling test. It's, wow. It reminded me of going back home and taking my mm -hmm. dictionaries. It was an open test. It was tough. It wasn't easy. Mm -hmm. The texts were very convoluted and mm -hmm. that structure of the sentences were really very tricky. You mm -hmm. need to know your language very well to know the meaning behind it wow. because it wasn't simple. Right. And I was very happy to pass. And then the budget cut happened and I couldn't, uh, I, they, they said, I already passed everything, passed oh. the polygraph, everything. And then the budget cut in 2008 and the right. crash happened. Right. Oh, but gosh. luckily, luckily, because later on I started doing interpreting and that paid way more than what the FBI would pay. Sure. And I love, I love interpreting. Yes. And my personality is for more to be uh, an interpreter. Yes. So, but... Uh, but I'm very interested to know, Tony, about the team, uh, how you were talking about teamwork. Yes, yes. Because I'm well, preparing for the state exam. And okay. I'm dying to have a team where I can work with to okay. prepare for this. Okay. Sorry, but... No, and that's test. okay. And that's, I mean, I think that's a perfect transition. I mean, as long as uh, in everybody, would everybody be okay with me transitioning to that? Because um, I did plan to talk Sorry. about that. Yeah, go ahead. Okay. Yeah. okay. All right. So that's a great transition. And the question is, what about the team-based approach? Well, um, that I would say is probably my, my, my great cause, my great passion. That was certainly one of the reasons why I ended up even setting up my forum. Um, so, okay, a little bit of backstory as far as what happened there. So, as I mentioned, I started my, my, my training for an interpreter in the summer of 2015. I took the exam for the first time in the spring of 2016. So, that gave me an idea of certainly what the exam was about. And I realized that I, I, I really had to develop a lot of skills, right, to be able to do this, right, to be able to pass the exam. So I took the exam again, and by the way, I, I was just simply going at it as a very, I very intuitively realized that I would probably need to practice with other people. But what happened, I was reaching out to people around me and saying, hey, do you want to get together? And it was like, yeah, sure. But then we got together and nobody knew what to do, right? So we just would end up talking and I'd say, well, we got to try something. And it just, the idea was there, but we just weren't executing it, right? So a little bit of backstory. I took the exam again in September of 2016, and right around that time, I think I, I said, you know what, I need to do, I'm, I didn't pass the exam again, and I thought, I need to do something different, right? And I started applying my creative thinking skills in terms of what I could do differently, because by that point, I had completed the program already at SESI. And what I noticed is that a lot of people were going back to SESI even after they had finished the program like to take the classes all over again. And I thought, well, that didn't make sense to me. I thought I need to do something different. So that's when I started reaching out to just to individual interpreters that I saw were very dedicated, very focused, serious. And I said, listen, I've got an idea here about creating a team-based approach to passing the exam. And they said, well, what does that mean? And I said, okay, so this is what I envision. That we're going to meet and that we're going to, let's say, work on a simultaneous exercise together or one of the sites. What we're going to do is this, is that it's going to be focused on renditions and, and receiving feedback. So we could work with a group of three, for example. And um, so I will provide, I will do a rendition of this particular exercise. Like I said, let's just keep it on site to keep it simple. So I will do my best interpretation possible of this document. I'm gonna have two people listening to me. I'm gonna put lines, like line, uh, line, number, li line numbers on each, on, on the document to make it easy. So let's say 25 lines of text, right? And then, so I write on my, my grading sheet, you know, that line. And, if, and what I'm paying attention to, if I'm, if I'm in the role as the rater, is that I'm listening to word choice, I'm listening to backtracking, pauses, additions, omissions, 
all of the various um, criteria that we know that we're evaluated on, right? Uh, and so that's really what the team-based approach was all about, fundamentally. The rest were details, and we developed, we developed and refined the method as we went along. We just kept getting better and better and better at doing it. But the idea was basically that I just need to meet with people on a regular basis so that I can do a rendition and get feedback and then we can switch and I'll give feedback. And by the way, you end up learning so much either way, whether you're giving feedback or receiving feedback, you learn a lot. Now, as part of it, as part of kind of setting it up and putting structure to it, and I'll send this to you uh, in, in an email form, Having a team just starts with, with, a, with a group of three to five colleagues, right? You set up a weekly meeting. And during that weekly meeting, what you do is that you review the work that you did the week before, and then you plan for the week ahead, right? So what you might need to do during those weekly team meetings, for example, if you say, if you agree that you're going to work on this police report site from Edge 21, so you might get together during the weekly meeting and review the document together and, and come up with a key, right, where you're all in agreement as to how this particular word or phrase is going to be rendered, right? Um, and then you can come up even with your scoring units at that point if you want, hey, let's make this a scoring unit, let's make this, let's make this, let's make this, et cetera. You can do all that stuff during the weekly meeting. And then you agree to meet one, you know, one or two days during the week for, for now, you have a weekly team meeting and then you have the practice session meetings, right? So now you're working on delivering the material that you agreed on in advance, right? And again, you're, now you're attempting to deliver the most perfect rendition that you can with no backtracking, with good word choice. And then, you know, you're, the raters are listening again for your word choices, for your backtracks, for your pauses. What you want is to, to develop yourself to the point where you're delivering very professional, polished uh, renditions, right, that are, that are confident. In other words, that you're, you're preparing yourself for how you're going to deliver on the exam. Now, granted, if, you're, if this is a challenging exam or a challenging exercise, then you may not want to rush, you know, just do it once and then rush on to something else. You may want to continue working on that same exercise multiple weeks until you're delivering it at a very high level and then you move on, right? It does you no good to jump around and do all these different exercises and not do any of them well. The key is to get yourself to the point where you're doing a, a very professional, highly polished rendition. Another thing too, when you, um, I, 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 what I recommend is using Zoom for your meetings. That way you can also go back and listen to your own renditions so that you can hear what your colleagues are hearing when you're rendering. And ultimately, whenever you get feedback, you receive all the feedback that you get, you receive it graciously. You don't defend anything that you did. You don't explain why you did it. You just listen quietly to all the feedback that you get. You make a note of it. If there's some discrepancy that you discover later, in other words, that you basically have a disagreement with, with the correction that you got, then that's fine. Look it up. You know, ultimately render the word that you that you believe is correct, and then you can discuss it during the weekly meeting, if you will. Hey, guys, you know, I got a correction on this word. I did look it up. I consulted these three sources, and they're all in agreement that this should be the word. And that way you're not having any sort of confrontation in the moment, you know, with, with a colleague where you're, you guys are going back and forth as to the meaning of a word that, that can very easily happen. And it really brings down the, the, uh, the spirit of the meeting. So uh, another part of it is I believe very much in planning so that you have calendars. Everybody uses calendars and planners so that you guys plan on what exercises you're doing for the week and for the coming weeks. And then it's simply a matter of creating your plan and then executing your plan. Um, and so what you're agreeing on is materials that you're, that you're working with. You're agreeing to the terms of scoring units. Um, and then what you're going to do is you're going to schedule your practices with different team members throughout the week. That's why I advocate having five uh, team colleagues, <clears throat> because you're going to have 
uh, you know, colleagues with different areas of strength, right, in different areas. And so you want to leverage the strength of every team member, right? And then ultimately, you're going to have a strength and you're going to be an asset, you know, to one of your team members, right? But the key is to be getting a multitude of, of responses and feedback to your rendition, right? Um, and then the focus of the practices are on skill building and the fluidity of your rendition. Um, and then when I set up, the, the good thing too is that you can meet just with one team member when you set up your practice sessions. However, I always like the idea of meeting with two because that way, um, in case what will end up happening, if you're, if you've got, if you're a raider, you're listening to rendition, if, if your colleague uses a word that you think, oh, that didn't sound right, you make a note of it. Obviously, you're making a note of that word and your colleague keeps going on the rendition. So you might miss something else that they may have misspoken on or given a you know, an incorrect rendition on, but that's why it's helpful to have another set of ears because maybe whatever you miss, they'll catch, right? And then I, I also developed a way of, of giving feedback so that again, it's not confrontational at, at all. What I end up doing is this, is that when I hear somebody render, I never say, hey, you said this and it was wrong, it should be this. I never apply that approach. What I do is I ask, hey, in, in, sentence, or in line number three, do you recall what you said for that for that particular word? Yeah, I rendered the word justice as I said, you know, whatever, husky, you know, maybe who well, justicia is the right word. I said, um, you know, injusticia, injustice. Okay, so that's right. You said uh, injusticia. So, oh, that's right. And so I just pointed out and nine times out of 10, the interpreter themselves realize what they did wrong. And so they correct themselves. And I don't even have to make the correction. Does that make sense? I just pointed out that, hey, on this line, do you remember what you said? And then they think about it and they think, oh my God, yeah, I said this. Shoot, I should have said that. And so again, they're, they are correcting themselves just by, by you pointing out, right? That there was, some, there was something that was, let's say, a miss in that line. And nine times out of 10, like I say, I found that my, my colleagues will themselves know what they missed. Um, and then, um, and so, because let's face it, you know, when you're giving feedback to colleagues, you have to be very delicate because this is very sensitive um, and you always want to preserve the integrity and not, not the integrity, but you want to preserve the, um, the, uh, the self-esteem, if you will, of your colleagues um, so that you never want to feel like, they never want to feel that you're undermining them or their ability or anything else because this is, as you know, a very difficult thing that we're doing and it really, we have to enhance our confidence at every step of the way, right? Um, so by applying this approach, it got me used to the idea of interpreting for colleagues, of being scrutinized, of being evaluated. And so when I go in now, you know, for any sort of evaluation for an exam, it's, it's like I'm, I'm swimming in a, in a familiar pond, right? It's not anything that intimidates me or scares me at all. It's quite the contrary. I'm, I'm excited about it. I'm confident when I'm going in for an exam and an evaluation, right? I'm, I've, I've got nothing to fear Okay, uh, so because I've, I've prepared for it. What's that? Yeah, I was going to ask, Tony, um, that, that sounds like really a good plan. Yeah. Um, how, do you, how do you practice in a, in a team approach? Um, Zainab... Uh, myself and uh, another interpreter they tried that for the last exam and, and I think we've we followed basically what you're yeah. doing right. now two questions yeah. where's the material that you you, you right. mentioned that you had uh, you had gone to Southern Southern California School of Interpretation is right. that the material you used or question. where were your no. resources and the second question is how do you apply that when it came to simultaneous and consecutive okay great questions okay so first of all, regarding materials, I'll tackle that first. I believe that in order to do, to, to do your best on this exam, you, you have to have good, good materials. There's just no doubt about it, right? And all your team members have to have the same materials, obviously, right? So I kind of touched on it in my bio that in the spring of 2017, I started taking classes with, Ed, with Virginia Valencia and Edgar because I felt that I needed something more, right? 
So I felt that the, uh, the materials that I got from the SESI only got me so far and that I needed something more. I needed to supplement that. So I thought Edgar provided some great materials that are very closely aligned with the types of language and material that you do find on a state exam. Um, and then um, where I think obviously we're very blessed and fortunate as, as Spanish interpreters, Virginia Valencia has developed some brand new training materials and a breakthrough method also that obviously would be more, more relevant and, and more useful to Spanish speaking interpreters. But certainly what I used to prepare at that time was Virginia Valencia for note-taking, which I recommend to everybody. If you think your consecutive note-taking skills are good, well, practice more and, and use her method, you know. Um, if you've got all the symbols down, then use all of her methods with regard to how you put everything on the page and everything else. There's a lot more to her technique than just the symbols. Um, but that's ultimately, I felt, I feel so strongly about Virginia Valencia's method for consecutive for note taking that I always tell people I would not have passed consecutive had I not gotten comfortable with, with that note taking. I was thinking that. And you're gonna have her as a guest. So. Yeah, yeah. So so that she's she's just amazing, you know. And she developed that herself. I mean, well, there were, she developed that herself, but based on the work of some other, you know, people that that, that went before her, and she always acknowledges them too. So um, anyway, so Virginia Valencia then, okay, so materials that I used were Edge 21 from Acebo, Interpreter's Edge from Acebo, uh, Trans Interpreting Materials, and then um, some, some Virginia Valencia. So. Um, yeah, Selma, we used yeah. all those too. We used the yeah. consecutive Virginia, of course, she's yeah. top. Yeah. And Edgar Hidalgo has great materials that yeah. is related to the exam. Yes. What did we use from the, Virginia Valencia, Zena? Uh, the note taking. Oh, towards the end, like right yeah. before we yeah, took the Yeah, towards the end. We yeah. really didn't. Not I too much, suck right? at this. <laughs> <laughs> I yeah. Really. Okay. Well, I would say I don't know how you did in consecutive, but I mean, we didn't have like extensive I did sixty-five percent. Mm -hmm. I yeah. bombed it. Mm -hmm. Well, sixty-five is is still pretty good. So I mean, if you just focus. My name passing. On the on the consec on the note taking method, it's going to help your your consecutive. That do they have it like for just English? I mean, I I looked on like the website for interpreting. Neutral. Yeah, I think that they do have language neutral for it. Should be a language neutral class. I mean, okay. that's the good thing about yes, it. Yes, I is going to be our guest oh, next thank time. You. So. Okay, well that's yeah. good. May so may, may, may I suggest something? Yes. Okay, you know what I what first of all you know what I hearing you saying you know what in what in how you're explaining um in uh, uh in your group meetings it's yes. all interactive yes and that is very important i agree you, you cannot just receive you have to be able to produce as well exactly and and you know the more you produce yes. the you know the more uh, knowledge and you the more skill you develop exactly which is, I mean, those are fantastic. You know, information is fantastic. You know, everybody has to have it. Yes. But there are a couple of very impo important um, exercises. Uh, shadowing. Yes. Mm. I can, and I do it to this day. Yes. You know, and I shadow, I listen to NPR in my car uh -huh. and I shadow to this day. Mm -hmm. It's okay. very and when you're listening to NPR, what is it that you do? I, I, no, I shadow in the same language. I just okay. stay behind okay. a whole, you know, a whole okay. uh, idea. Yes. Because with, for the simultaneous or for yes. both, you yes. really, you know, for the consecutive and for the simultaneous, your short term memory has to be really 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 good mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and this is okay. one way to uh, improve on the short-term memory okay so, uh -huh. and, and and the note-taking mm -hmm. um you know when i took my exam it, i we didn't have any of those we didn't have any material you know the only mm -hmm. material i had was a uh, the dictionary by somebody called El Faruqi, 
you know, mm -hmm. that's for the Arab, um, wow. Arabic speaking people. That's the dictionary I had. But what I did is I got a book of uh, criminal procedures, the one mm -hmm. that taught to uh, uh, law school students. Mm -hmm. And I studied that book. Yes, yes. Not only that I studied it, but yes. I also tried to, you know, I mean, not sit down and translate it, right. but also try, you know, to convert the same right. ideas into my other, into the Arabic language. Right, right. And I also found some trials online, and I forgot who the name of the person was, but this lady in California who uh, was accused of... Uh, uh, drowning her daughter in the mm -hmm. swimming pool. Mm -hmm. The whole trial was on YouTube. Yes. And I practiced my conservative that way. Okay, smart. Wow. Right. And so, yeah. And for the note taking, I tried to learn the symbols. I went one time to uh, one uh, uh, workshop. I, I, for the life of me, I could not do yeah. the symbols. Yeah. But I developed my own, and this is okay. what I encourage everybody. I mean, it's good to know a couple of symbols, you know, like yeah. handy, you know, be the house, a police car, <laughs> cop, you yeah. know, things yeah. like that. Yeah. But you have to, because if you don't remember it, if you don't know what it means, it's no use to you. Right. Yeah, understood. Yeah. Understood. Yeah. So, so I developed my own, and what I do is actually, I do mostly writing, but what I write, only a couple of words mm -hmm. to jot my memory. Yes. And I try to write a couple of words for every unit of idea. Mm -hmm. Okay. You know, it's so I know, okay, if there are three ideas here, there are three, I, I put three words. Okay. Or four words to remind me right. that I have to produce those three ideas. Right. Oh, wow. That's, that's my way, you know. Right, I, understood. It's my way okay. of doing it. By the way, let me just say thank you. First of all, thank you for sharing this experience, and it's it's obviously it's it's experience from the wealth of your own experience, right? I'm I'm just learning this as I go along here. Uh, so Virginia Valencia would agree with everything that you just said that the that that the main point of even her method is just to write down something to jog your memory, right? And that's all that the symbols help you to do, right? Right. Um, and so what I will say in defense of her system is this, is the way I try to explain it is this. I've heard this from a lot of people. Oh, Tony, the symbols doesn't work for me. Oh, I look at that as blah, blah, blah. I get it. However, her system, her, her, her symbols are very intuitive that when you see it, you go, oh my God, of course that makes sense. You know, to think is an exclamation point, right? Or I saw, I observed. I watched, it's just a circle with a little dot and a little eyeball, right? The beauty of those is that you learn, let's say 40, 50 of those, you get, you get it down cold. Again, it frees up now your space and your memory because you hear the word I saw, you know, you have your little eyeball. I saw the man, I think he was, and then you think, okay, think. And then I think he was walking out of that building. You do the little thing for the, the roof of the building, right? So you've got that down. And then in the meantime, your brain is freed up and you're relaxed to be able to hear all the other ideas that are being expressed, right? And especially under the high press, high stress pressure of an exam, what you want is to be relaxed and to be taking in all of that information that's coming at you, right? Keep in mind that on the exam, you're guaranteed to get uh, three segments that are 40 to 50 words long. That's pretty tough to keep straight in your short-term memory if you don't have some kind of system, right? So agreed that you, the goal is ultimately for you to develop your own system of symbols that work for you that make sense. But I tell you what, you know, Virginia Valen Valencia gives you a good foundation to build on, right? Um, so it's, you know, it's because the problem sometimes of using your own system is that, you um, you know, uh, it's it's a consistency thing, you know, or you, yeah. can you can develop Virginia's, if you will, and then modify it as needed, you know? Yeah, I'm not, I'm not at all against it, you know, right. and I'm not discouraging people from taking it, sure. you know, and, and, you know, people, you know, they should, even if they were able to 
utilize half of the symbols and right. you know fill in the rest you're, with their you're own. ahead you're ahead it's yeah. you're, you are absolutely ahead which is you know and i do things like that like you know quotation marks of you know you know he said it's a he quotation yes. mark said yes uh ask question i do question mark yes and uh I emphasize, I mean, if there is a very or, you yes. know, yes. I put a line on the word that means Good. this is, yeah. That's it. Is, Good. Yeah. Things that like that. Great. That sounds great. And those are the kinds of things that she does. Too. I, I, what I, I like, what I liked about, uh, uh, I call it Roseanne methods because it's actually Roseanne's method, not Virginia with, and Virginia gives the emphasis that it is, uh, yes. uh, You're Roseanne's right. methods and all conference interpreters. And when we yes. go to school, this is what we learn at school. Yes. It is, yes. it is. And so, so I prefer calling it Roseanne methods or yes. Gilles methods, Andre yes. Gilles from, from but, there is, there is a difference. There is a difference. There is a there is a there is a difference, but the the mm -hmm. but really who started it? It's it's Rosa. And you're so, right. And and you're right. And yeah. I mentioned that that Virginia Valencia does give credit to yes. uh to to Rosanne, um and Julie's for their work. Uh, by the way, so I started off with that book, <laughs> spent yeah. a few weeks with it, and then at the end of it, couldn't make heads or tails of it. Um, and it was referred to me by an interpreter. And then I reached out to that interpreter and I said, listen, I said, I, I have to admit, I'm, I'm a bit of a dummy. Uh, it's very hard <laughs> for me to understand things. I said, could you explain to me this book, you know, that you recommended and how you believe it helped you? And then she said, yeah, I'm willing to meet with you. And I said, okay, thanks. Cause I would really appreciate it. So we met and it was incredible because we, I will never forget. I'm sitting at an outdoor cafe waiting for her. She shows up and drops Virginia Valencia's book right in front of me. <laughs> and then I'm looking at the because book. Because it's more practical. <laughs> yep. I'm looking at the book. Yes. And I said, oh, yeah. my God, this makes sense. Okay, this is what I needed. Thank you very much. We're done here. No, exactly. I'm just I mean, <laughs> yeah. it was like I, I looked at her and I said, oh, my God, this is what I need. I needed, I needed no taking for dummies. I said, and that's what this is. I said, this is fantastic. Thank you. I said, that other stuff, oh my God, I spent weeks on it. Is the, and it was just, it's theory, oh, theory, it yes. was, theory. Oh, yes. my God. Yes, yeah. Now, what I wanted to say also about, um, about the test and preparing for the test, in Pennsylvania, they give us the test into two, uh, the oral test. Um, the simultaneous, if we pass the simultaneous, then we are mm -hmm. allowed to take the consecutive okay. and the site. So we don't take the three okay. together. And because I'm preparing now only for the simultaneous, right. and because I have uh, an academia background in, in mm -hmm. translation and interpretation, I I'm, I'm really feel that the interpreters in the United States are heroes because they got the courage of doing it without going to school. Mm -hmm. And they are getting certified and they're doing great job yes. doing it. It's really very hard work. Yes. I have, I have the school in translation and I took interpretation when I was in Lebanon as a school, uh, wow. as in college. You're fortunate. And yeah. I still feel that, oh my God, am I allowed to do this? Because in Lebanon, interpreters, you have to have, you have to be licensed by the government and blah, blah, blah. Anyway. Yeah. Yeah, so. Yeah. I am getting, I'm trying to get my courage. And as you said, the self-esteem is very important yes. in interpreting and, and criticizing an interpreter is really a very, it's a skill that we need because I also train interpreters in medical fields. Yes. We should be very careful how very gentle. we do yeah. it. Yeah. Very right. gentle because right. it's our self-esteem that like makes us a good interpreter. It's or a bad interpreter. true. And, and it's, it's critical for success on the exam, I believe. Yeah. Yeah, and our professor would always criticize us after giving us at least two positives. That's it. Absolutely, <laughs> I would. Do, I would do the same yeah. approach. It's well, always I'd always two start positive with positive. And then, always, yes. always. And Very good. the other thing is for uh, for simultaneous, we always uh, start, and this is how I study now: is going back to sight. Start with the sight. Everything from the first, what I always tell my students: everything is in. From the first sight, mm -hmm. if you master your sight translation, mm -hmm. you can master your simultaneous. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because once you start doing sight very uh, skillfully, mm -hmm. you're going to see the words when you are doing simultaneously and do it the same way. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, that, 
Yes. Yeah, I'm sorry. It's just getting a little bit late, and I think Tony wanted to speak a little bit about Oops, sorry. The touch yeah. base on uh, AB5, right? AB5, yes. Yeah, I'm sorry may, about that. May I only... Many, may I only just add one thing? Uh, I wanted to go back again to Sausan. So Sausan said something very interesting about interpreting NPR news. So mm -hmm. I will send everyone the link, which is, I think, many interpreters know. Uh, there are some conferences and speeches, uh, different um, uh, recordings. I just sent it on the chat. And you can use these uh, for practice because you will never have news radio news on the exam that we are taking like for court but speeches or something like that it's more the language is more uh, similar than from the news so oh, nice. i think Good. you can try thank you yeah. for sharing so, sorry. <laughs> no that's wonderful thank you okay, well no and this is i mean i'm glad that we're having these conversations um and, and um, you know we're th there's a great exchange of ideas here there was, just to be fair also, because there was a question that was posed to me about simultaneous, and I did want to touch on that a little bit and offer some ideas there, because obviously that's another important area um, to prepare for the exam. And that is simply that I remember that one of the great benefits that I got out of preparing for my experience at immigration court is that SCSI provided recordings that were at 160 words a minute. So it was like the same script at 120, 140, and 160. When I heard the recordings at 160, I told my wife, it's impossible for me to do this. My tongue doesn't move that fast. Um, and but I, but I was told, but nonetheless, I have to get up to that speed. And I thought, how in the world am I going to do it? Well, it's like anything else, practice, right? And I got to a point where I was almost jumping in to do the only the practices at 160 and 140, because I felt, well, that's where I need to be anyways. And so I highly recommend practicing at those higher rates of speed because the exam, the state exam is at 120 words a minute. If you're practicing at 160 and 140, the 120 sounds like you're talking like this. So you hear everything coming at you very clearly, if you will, and you're just, you know, you're, you're right there where you need to be. Um, Another thing too that I did that I feel that made a difference for me is that I wanna be as comfortable as possible in the exam room. And so for me, that meant that I stood when I delivered my simultaneous rendition, I closed my eyes and I was not in an exam room, but I was actually in a courtroom, right? Because I'll never forget that when I heard the sound of the judge speaking, I had my eyes closed and I could visualize where in the courtroom the judge was sitting and speaking. And then I heard the next voice. It was the voice of the attorney. And again, I had my eyes closed and I could visualize where the courtroom that attorney was. And then the next voice was the defendant. And so I had everything just, uh, and then here I am. I'm the interpreter in a courtroom. I'm not in the, in the exam room and this is a high stakes exam. Does that make sense? And so that really helped me to, again, have the confidence that I needed. And when I'm standing, I project my voice and, and, and I wanted my voice to be clear and to be well heard. And I wanted to enunciate everything well and, and all those things, right? So those are the things that I was focusing, focusing on during the exam. Does that, does that, and, and I hope that that helps as well. Yeah, thank you. All right, sure. So now AB5, now what to say about AB5? First of all, does everybody know what AB5 is? Kind Before of. Before you start that, <laughs> Can I just give another advice, something yes. that I use in my experience? This is yes. what we, yeah, so I'm certified in New York State, but it seems like New York State is, uh, I mean, way uh, lower level than California. But uh, as somebody who has a legal background, uh, and I, uh, I advise uh, everyone to have an idea about the American laws. Take something that teaches you all the notions. I find, for example, what I, one of the what I used, a, a book uh, uh, called Law 101. And that book exists also on an audio version. And what I was doing is while I was driving, I would inter interpret that simultaneously. And you can, uh, you know, the speed you can, uh, it's available on Audible and you can adjust the speed you want. So make it slower, make it faster, yes. different, and, and it, only, it also gives you an idea about uh, the law. 
itself. It's an amazing book, uh, well written and well read. So that's uh, one of the. If you can write it on the chat or just send it to me and I will share it with the group. Thank you. Sure. Uh, you can also take a course on uh, Coursera called Introduction to American Law. That's also a very a good uh, course, or uh, and it's from, I think, Yale University or, or Pennsylvania University. Yeah, I will write it on the chat. So sorry to interrupt you, but I know that okay. it helped me a lot, and uh, I think it will help anyone who, especially somebody who doesn't have a background in. No, this is great, and this is you're confirming precisely the value of interpreters coming together to meet, to talk, to brainstorm, to offer resources and suggestions and ideas. I mean, you just mentioned another one that I had forgotten about, but Coursera is also something else that's out there. That's just another terrific resource, you know. And my goodness, that's ultimately why I think again I developed the Resource Center as a way of of getting the word out there about the existence. And of it's free. Somebody. And it's yeah. free, you know, can't beat it. Yeah, I All wanted right. to add something like for a consecutive, uh, for sorry, for Simon yeah. it's what I used and I told most of the friends I know, uh, court reporters training on YouTube. They have different speeds and they use like uh, all legal words and mm -hmm. uh, like you can, let's say, jury instruction and other things that you are familiar with and that come in the exam. Court reporter use it. And they have a lot of training on YouTube with different speeds, like I say. Yep. I've, I've heard that as well from other people, and I keep forgetting that that's out there. Yeah, I've never actually seen that, but I can imagine that that would be a if wonderful If you write on people. Google, jury charge 140. Okay. And you will see a picture of a dog. <laughs> okay. if, uh, I can, uh, okay. if, you if you like to write it now and share it. And yeah. this is where, yeah, yeah this yeah. is one of the best ones I found. And... Uh, it's okay. jury instruction. Okay. And then there is also, like, there is a lot of uh, those resources. Like, you can just, you know, choose and pick which one you like, like uh, the voice, the sound, everything, you know? Okay. Very good. Well, thank, thank you so you, much. And so, so obviously, yeah. obviously, just focusing on, and by the way, the, all the stuff that, that I did provide, all the details regarding the exam, I mean, the, the team-based approach, it's really just a very, very basic overview. As you can imagine, with something like that, there's a lot of, of working parts to it, you know. Um, I, I did have the opportunity, actually, to speak in Arizona uh, for the Arizona Court Interpreters Association, and that was the focus of my presentation. And I ended up, I think, speaking for just three hours on the team-based approach. So there, there was enough content there for a three-hour presentation. So um, it's really quite extensive and quite involved, but at least it gave you an overview of what the team-based approach is. But it's something that I've developed over three years now. I'm working with a team right now to prepare for the, for the federal exam. And I worked with the team for my state exam, for my medical exam, and now for the federal. And I, I just can't imagine doing it any other way. Thank you, Tony. It's almost eight. It's been two hours. I'm, I know two that. Two hours. Wow. <laughs> so the time, time, time flew. Time difference. Yes. Yeah. Yes, yeah. I understand. All right, guys. Well, thank you so much for your time and your attention. I hope that this that this time together was helpful for all of you. It was, was certainly great. helpful for me. Um, and then, yeah. keep, if, if no, if some of you are not members of the Resource Center forum, that's also an option for for all of you as well. Yes, thank you, Tony. Right. Thank you so much, okay. Tony. Well, thank welcome. you, everyone. Good night. Thank you very much, Tony. We really appreciate it. Thank you for your participation. Yeah, thank all you. Right. Okay, good night. Thank you all. Bye bye. Good night. Bye -bye.